Thank you, Mr. President. Um, is there a quorum in place? Yes, there is. Um, I ask unanimous consent that the quorum call be vitiated. Without objection. Thank you, um, Mr. President. Uh, I rise to speak on morning business. Uh, this afternoon, quite possibly, or another time, quite possibly, uh, we will have very strong amendments that will strip EPA of its mandate to protect the American public from pollution, which threatens our public health and welfare by inducing climate change. Specifically, I strongly oppose the McConnell Amendment, which would be a complete stop work order for the Environmental Protection Agency to reduce carbon pollution. I also oppose Senator Stabenow's amendment, which would strip California of its right to impose tailpipe emission standards beyond federal standards. California has had the right to go beyond the federal standards to protect its citizens from dangerous pollution since 1970. That's 40 years. And I oppose Senator Rockefeller's proposal to prevent EPA from studying, developing, improving, or enforcing Clean Air Act greenhouse gas regulations for at least two years. I oppose these amendments because they would allow polluters to keep polluting. They would endanger public health and welfare, and they would increase our dependence on oil. And this is exactly the opposite of what we should be doing. As the lead author of the bipartisan 10 in 10 Fuel Economy Act, with Senator Snow and Senator Ted Stevens, which passed this body by voice vote, I would like to explain why the McConnell Amendment would undermine fuel economy and lead to less efficient vehicles in the United States. The amendment would legislatively prevent EPA from acting to reduce vehicle emissions that threaten our public health after 2017. And it would also strip California of its right to protect its own citizens from dangerous pollution. The prohibition would undermine the bill we sought to pass and did pass and was signed by President Bush. And that is 10 miles of, uh, of increased fuel efficiency in 10 years and it directed the Environmental Protection Agency and the Department of Transportation to work cooperatively to increase fuel economy and decrease pollution. Mr. President, this was a big win. I began in 1993 with Senators Slade Gorton and Dick Bryant, no longer in the Senate, one from Washington and one from uh, Nevada. And we sat right over there and tried to draft some language for a sense of the Senate, something as benign as a sense of the Senate, to begin to work on automobile fuel efficiency, and we couldn't get it passed. Then Senator Snow and I got together on um, a SUV loophole closer bill, and that went on for several years, and we couldn't get that passed. And then the 10 in 10 fuel efficiency bill, and voila, we were able to get it passed. And it is going well. And cars are more fuel efficient. And corporate average fuel efficiency standards are being interpreted in a much more constructive way based on science. As a result of the law, the administration has put forward the most aggressive increase in vehicle efficiency since the 1970s increasing fleet-wide fuel economy to 35 miles per gallon by 2016. The final rules will save about 1.8 billion barrels of oil and reduce by nearly a billion tons of greenhouse gas emissions over the lives of the vehicles covered. Seems to me that's very good public policy. As a result, American consumers benefit. They'll have more efficient vehicles and they will pay less for gas. And those savings are considerable. This single program to reduce oil uh, consumption and greenhouse gas emissions under the 10 in 10 Fuel Economy Act and the Clean Air Act results in an aggressive policy to advance the goals of both laws. 
The regulations also demonstrate that strong federal standards are the best means to ensure that California and other states are not legally obligated to enforce more aggressive standards to protect the uh, health of their citizens, a right California has had since 1970. Bottom line, these harmonized standards demonstrate the success of 10 in 10 fuel economy. Despite the tremendous success of this first round of joint fuel economy and tailpipe regulations, the McConnell Amendment would prevent the EPA, the Department of Transportation, and California from pursuing cooperative and coordinated standards again. Similarly, the Stabenow Amendment would prevent California from participating in this process. This would halt an ongoing cooperative process to set a single set of cost-effective standards for cars, trucks, and SUVs from 2017 to 2025, which will increase fuel economy, which will reduce pollution, and which will save Americans billions of dollars. It's backwards public policy. EPA and the Department of Transportation have already conducted the technical assessment, which demonstrates that a significant increase in fleet-wide fuel economy, 6% annually, is both technically feasible and cost-effective for consumers. They are working to complete a single set of standards in full cooperation with California. But the McConnell Amendment and the Stabenow Amendment would both stop this effort because the auto industry would prefer to sell gas guzzlers than continue, that continue our dependence on oil. And the amendments prevent waivers that have been a part of the Clean Air Act for decades, preventing leading states like California from doing anything beyond the national standard. So it both handcuffs and cripples corporate average fuel efficiency. It stymies it. It stops it. it California is 38 million people. We are our own pace setter. We want to work with the rest of the states to have a unified standard so that we are not our own economy, so to speak, with fuel efficiency. And that's the right thing to do. And it is happening now. And this would put an end to it. The amendments prevent waivers, as I said, that have been part of this act for decades. And that means that never again, no matter what the circumstances, can there be a waiver. It would turn back the clock on historic efforts to improve the efficiency of the nation's automobiles and slow any future effort to reduce pollution and improve fuel economy. Bottom line, a vote for this amendment is a vote to increase our susceptibility to oil market price spikes. Let there be no doubt. A vote to increase how much Americans will spend at the pump for decades to come. It'll be much, much more. And a vote to increase pollution that threatens our public health. Unfortunately, these amendments not only stop the vehicle rules, the McConnell Amendment strips EPA of its authority to enforce the Clean Air Act with regard to pollutants that EPA scientists have conclusively determined endanger public health, and that the Supreme Court has said the EPA must enact in the Massachusetts decision. The Stabenow and Rockefeller Amendments similarly delay this action polluters would be able to continue to pollute, and the agency charged with protecting us from this pollution would be powerless to stop it or even limit it. Blocking the Clean Air Act and its life-saving protections makes no sense. This act has had a long and successful track record of reducing pollution and protecting the health of our children and our families.
Since its passage in 1970, the Act has sharply reduced pollution from automobiles, industrial smokestacks, utility plants, and major sources of toxic chemicals and particular matter. In its first 20 years, the Act made real strides in reducing pollution that provided enormous benefits for public health. In 1990 alone, the Act prevented 205,000 premature deaths, 674,000 cases of chronic bronchitis, 22,000 cases of heart disease, 850,000 asthma attacks, and 18 million child resp respiratory illnesses. The Clean Air Act continues to provide benefits for our children and our family. Emissions of six common pollutants have dropped 41%. In 2010, 1.7 million asthma attacks were prevented, 130,000 heart attacks, and 86,000 emergency room visits. That's in one year alone this past year. And it provides economic benefit to the United States. Thoroughly peer-reviewed studies have found that for every $1 spent on clean air protections, we get $30 of benefits in return. In 2020 alone, the annual benefits of the Clean Air Act's rules are estimated to be nearly $2 trillion. Now, advocates for these amendments argue the United States cannot afford environmental protection. They continue to say we must poison our air and water in order to develop our country. I just don't believe that. Pollution is a burden on our economy. It's not a force for good. And cost-effective reduction makes our nation stronger, not weaker. We harm our economy when we ignore pollution. So time and time again, the people of California have demonstrated that we are unwilling to choose between a healthy environment and a healthy economy because we choose both, and so should the United States. I strongly encourage my colleagues to reject these misguided amendments, whether they come up this afternoon at 4 o'clock or another time that would let polluters off the hook, that would increase our dependence on oil, that would increase, uh, I should say, in, would increase the mileage of autom excuse me, decrease the mileage efficiency of automobiles and light trucks and would harm our environment. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the floor. The absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the room. Mr. Akaka.
debate and vote on small business legislation on the Senate's agenda this afternoon. In the meantime, negotiations continue on a final deal on the federal budget. Temporary funding of government operations runs out on April 8th. While there have been hints that an agreement has been reached, House Speaker John Boehner says that uh, no final spending deal has been struck, while noting that House Republicans cannot unilaterally impose their will on fiscal 2011 appropriations decisions. This is an article from CQ today by Kerry Young and Sam Goldfarb. Less than 24 hours after Vice President Biden said congressional leaders had settled on a tentative $33 billion figure for spending cuts in fiscal year 2011, Mr. Boehner said the number was not etched in stone. Quote, there's no agreement on numbers and nothing will be agreed to until everything has been agreed to, Mr. Boehner said, adding negotiations are continuing.
Senator from West Virginia. Mr. President, all I, I Mr. President, I ask you now, Mr. Country, the order of the quorum call be rescinded. Uh, Mr. President, all of my colleagues, I think, know by now, after all of these months, almost years, how deeply I feel about the need to stop EPA regulation for a period of time so that Congress can have the time that we need to develop a smart energy policy, which we have not. It's enormously important to the people of West Virginia. Having said that, and I'll say quite a lot more, I cannot tell you how strongly opposed I am to the McConnell-Inhofe Amendment, not only because it goes too far, not only because it eviscerates EPA from some, uh, some fundamental responsibilities that it has, for example, CAFE standards, but it has, Mr. President, absolutely no chance whatsoever of becoming law. None. Mine does. Theirs doesn't. Think the, we think we're going to pass, the President's going to sign something that eliminates EPA forever? Oh, they'll say, well, we can always change that in a couple of years. No, it isn't that. It's a theological decision to pick out a campaign issue for 2012, and, but, and that's fine because that's the way things go, things go, but to destroy the EPA permanently since I came here. Now, there will be people in many states, including my own, that think that's a wonderful idea, but I would require them, ask them, to think more deeply. The McConnell-Inhofe Amendment makes a point but it doesn't solve a problem. I'm here to solve problems. So is the presiding officer. The amendment would take away EPA's ability to address greenhouse gas emissions, slash, forever. Doesn't make any difference what happens five years, ten years from now, greenhouse emissions, you know, nuances that have to be made in policy or in regulation. Um, air starts cleaning up, maybe things can lighten up a little bit, doesn't clean up, maybe we have to do something. But if you take away and you just put out of business forever the EPA, which looks out for the health and the safety of everyone who lives here, would be, and it would be permanently banned from doing its job. Is this an adult amendment? It can't be. People must only be looking at the next election, or they must, be, they must be afraid. To be afraid of voters is not a good thing. That's a quick way to lose. 
tell the voters the truth, the presiding officer is pretty good at this, um, is what's more important in public policy. So they burn it forever. It can't do anything no matter what we know or what we learn in the future about greenhouse emissions. The total elimination of EPA's role with no other structure in place, nothing in place is irresponsible, unrealistic, and immature. What we need is a timeout to stop the imposition of EP regulations, regulations that don't allow for the development of clean technologies that would hurt the economy at a critical point in our, in our recovery, but to do it in a way that keeps us all focused and working on a long-term energy policy, which doesn't say close down. So we're going to have a pause here, the pause that refreshes, hopefully refreshes our ability to do clean energy policy. My bill would be effective from the date of its passage were it to pass, um, so it would, be, it would be two years. That's plenty of time to be able to uh, come up with an energy policy. We've, we've avoided doing that for so long now, and I think a lot of that is politics, and it's very sad. The Environmental Protection Agency, I have to say, including to my own constituents, is not a frivolous agency. It's the object of much scorn in my state now, and a lot of states that produce coal, and probably, you know, the minds of a lot of senators. It was created to regulate pollution. Uh, you think back to wartime London, where you couldn't see five feet in front of your face. I think back to when I was a student in Japan for three years at the end of the 50s, and you couldn't see three feet in front of your face. Now, all of a sudden, you can see for a thousand miles, so to speak, because the air is clean. The Environmental Protection Agency is not a frivolous agency. It was created to, to regulate pollution. That is its job. Does that make it uncomfortable? Yes. Does that make me want to pass my amendment? Yes. To have a stop for a period of two years where they cannot go to stationary sources and others and say, um, you know, you, you can't do anything. It's a pause. But at the end of the pause, it stops. It doesn't put EPA out of business. It's, it's just, it's, it's crazy. It is Congress's job to legislate, and that includes energy policy. Granted, stipulated. I think the presiding officer would say that that was lawyers say. It's, it's stipulated, makes it fact. Congress passed the Clean Air Act in 1970 and is updated in the decades that followed. Is the Clean Air Act perfect? Certainly not. Certainly not. Very few laws ever are, which is why we always are open to making them better. But eviscerating the EPA's ability to do its job forever is nonsense. It's childlike. Take my football and I'm going home. Feels good. Some voters will get up and cheer, standing up for coal. Well, well you know what this really does? This is, this is standing up for natural gas. I don't have any, we have a lot of natural gas in West Virginia. Natural gas has 50% of the carbon uh, that uh, the coal does. So that people think that by doing this, that um, people are going to go ahead and burn coal in power plants and other places. They're not. North Carolina already has 12 power plants which have been switched from coal the natural gas. Probably more by now. That was about a year ago. Ohio is doing some of the same. Other states are doing some of the same. Natural gas is abundantly plentiful. I like natural gas. It's a terrific thing. It's 50% it's as dirty as coal, but it is less dirty and it is cheaper. And so power plants are going to that. Now, I'm trying to figure out in my mind, Madam Chairman, how does that help West Virginians? How does that help West Virginia coal operators, or more importantly to me, coal miners? If people are suddenly making up their mind that they're going to, and I've had the president of American Electric Power tell me this directly, of course we'll switch to natural gas. He put it more succinctly. He said, I'd, I'd, 
I would use banana peels if they could produce heat. They don't stay with coal out of loyalty. They have to deal with certainty. Here we create permanent punting about what the landscape is going to be for energy use and the making of electric power in our country. And again, may I please bring up once again, Madam President, that this bill has no chance of becoming law. The McConnell Inhofe bill has no chance of becoming law. So why, why do they do it? They, they have to know that. I don't think it'll pass in here. It's certainly isn't going to pass the White House. In politics, you can say, oh, well, I wish there were a different a Republican president in the White House. There isn't. The Democratic one. He's not going to let this happen. He's not going to have an executive agency with an enormous amount to do with CAFE standards and all kinds of regulations. He's not going to have it obliterated, eviscerated, eliminated. He won't do that. He'll veto it if it should ever get that far. So what's going on in their minds? What do they think they're doing? Are they trying to impress their constituents? Are they holding high the banner, say, look, I'm courageous. I'll just get rid of this whole EPA thing and we can all celebrate together. Pretty short-sighted, I would say. Pretty short-sighted. Feel good, yes. Do good, no. I think it's well known that in West Virginia we have very serious disagreements with the EPA. I say all kinds of things about the EPA, constantly, in all kinds of situations. But, you know, people do care about clean air. They do care about clean water. Also, it's not a sin. Sometimes in America you can get the best of both worlds. We want a strong future for clean coal. And we want a national energy policy that protects and promotes clean coal. Now let me make a point. When I say the word clean coal, the only hearing of that is coal. People don't hear the word clean. So I have to make a point here. Don't blame coal miners for this. Coal miners go into the mines every day in these unbelievably difficult situations, and they mine the coal that's there. It's been there for a billion years, or 10 billion years that got put there. That's their job. Maybe it's high ash, maybe it's low ash. Maybe it's high sulfur, maybe it's low sulfur. They mine what's there, and then that gets shipped to a power plant or to uh, other countries for steelmaking purposes. One of the ideas about all of this is some of the loudest anti um, my amendment, my little two-year amendment that stops at the end of two years, comes from coal operators who actually don't ship much, power, much coal to power plants. They ship most of their coal because it's low sulfur overseas to the growing market in South Korea and China and a lot of other places and Japan. So what difference does it make to them? None. But they want to be in the chorus. So they join the chorus about let's get rid of EPA. They're not affected. They're just mainlining it right overseas and making tons of money because it's very low sulfur coal and very, very good for making steel. And we know that if coal is frozen in time, the way Senators McConnell and Inhofe are proposing, it will be rapidly eclipsed by other energy sources. Oh yes, most especially natural gas. We have so much natural gas in West Virginia that you could swim in it if you could just get about 10, 15 feet underground. I like natural gas. It's a great asset to have it, the Marcellus Shale. Problems of fracking can be solved and will be through technology. But um, that's, that's what's going to happen. And then our coal miners are going to, they're going to look at some of their representatives on both sides of the aisle here and in, in, uh, in the House, and they're going to say, now wait a second, I thought you were protecting me. How come I'm not mining coal? 
How come they've also, some of these power plants have now switched to natural gas in the majority, let's say, a few years from now? So McConnell Inhofe as an amendment codifies the vicious uncertainty that is threatening coal today. Electric utilities are right now making, as I've indicated, investment decisions based upon that uncertainty. It's a bad place from which to make a decision. And with very few exceptions, logically, that means they are, are not building or rebuilding coal-fired plants. Natural gas will overtake coal. Now, West Virginia wins in either case because we have so much coal, we have so much natural gas. But in this particular amendment, I'm trying to protect coal miners and their jobs by having carbon capture and sequestration, by having a policy, and there are others that are out there. We already have two in West Virginia which are taking more than 90 percent of the carbon out of coal. They are at work, American Electric Power Company, Dow Chemical Company. They're both doing that, both making money out of it. And yes, the government helps but they're taking more than 90% or 90% of the carbon out of coal. Doesn't that turn coal into clean coal? Isn't clean coal what we want? Isn't that what we have to have? So this is all part of a drive for an energy future for West Virginia coal miners and others and other people around the country and for a clean energy future. So, in effect, my amendment is a timeout. It's the timeout that we need, and it's the only option on the table, Madam President, that can pass. It can pass. It's fine to bring an amendment here, which makes you feel good, muscular, anti-government, let's make government smaller, let's get rid of government, and swell your chest and feel good and put out a great press release, but then it gets, uh, ends up not passing the Senate or it ends up getting vetoed. One of the two is going to happen. So it's a non-starter. So I think a lot of those on the other side of the aisle are going to throw the vote for political purposes, as I indicated. If we can remember back to the Omnibus Reconciliation Act in December of last year, the Chamber of Commerce, the National Association of Manufacturers, the Coal Association, all Republicans had agreed to vote for my two-year amendment, timeout amendment. All of them. Papers calculated who it was, how we would get to 60 votes, and we got there. And then what happened, and this is a little bit in the weeds, and I apologize for that, um, but all of a sudden, nine Republicans withdrew from that omnibus reconciliation agreement. So there was no way it could come up. Now, why did they do that? I don't know. It was that the beginning of the master plan of thinking, we're going to make this an issue for the next two years so we can wipe out some more Democratic seats? It certainly didn't have anything to do with uh, energy policy. So, as I say, my amendment says that for a period of two years, EPA will not have the power to enforce greenhouse gas rules on uh, stationary sources, including power plants, manufacturing, and refineries. That kind of covers it. They can't do anything for a period of two years regulatory about power plants, manufacturing companies, or refineries for two years. But the moratorium would last for two years, and then it would stop. Why? Because two years is, in fact, enough time, if we could get ourselves together around here, for serious people to come up with a serious energy policy that includes clean coal and everything else on the face of the earth that works to get our country off of foreign oil. Two years is enough time to develop a plan to build the carbon capture and sequestration technologies and get them accepted by Wall Street, which will fund them endlessly once they're convinced that they're working uh, on a sufficient scale. And as I say, this is being demonstrated by American Electric Power Company 
and by the Dow Chemical Company in West Virginia right now. And I'll repeat again, they are taking 90% of the carbon out of coal. Sounds like a good deal to me. Natural gas has 50% carbon. Clean coal would have 10% carbon. Which is the better deal? I think the second one is. My amendment would lead to that. So I would say that two years is enough time to get past this pointless debate, this, this really pointless debate about whether climate science is real and find common ground on solutions that create jobs, protect the air we breathe, and make us energy independent. Two years is enough time to take the big decisions about greenhouse gases out of the hands of the regulators at EPA and put them back in the hands of Congress for two years. Greenhouse emissions are an enormously important issue, but they are not the only problem we face and cannot be allowed to take precedence over every other matter that affects our people. We really can find ways to solve this problem, to protect our core industries and lessen the cost. The joint CAFE rule is a big deal between the EPA and the Department of Transportation. It is a case in point and relevant to the debate today because it is also undermined by the McConnell-Inhofe Amendment. The CAFE rule saves Americans billions of gallons of gasoline and reduces the dependence on foreign oil. It does it very explicitly. It keeps going up. The air gets cleaner. Transportation, I think the figure is that transportation overall is something like 50, 60, maybe a little bit more percent of our air pollution problems. So the CAFE standards become very, very important. Most of us believe very strongly that we need to make our cars more efficient, not just for the environment, but also because of the high cost of gasoline and its impact on every single American family, not to mention our national security. But under the McConnell-Inhofe Amendment, EPA could never work again on fuel efficiency. And the recent progress that we've made, which is so widely supported by industry and the American people, would be undermined. This is not a solution. It is, as I said, a permanent punt or maybe a stunt. And I, Madam President, will not support that. Last year, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle declared, as I said, their support for my amendment, overwhelmingly. The, the, the daily newspapers that come out on the Hill calculated the 60 votes that I had to overcome a filibuster. U.S. Chamber of Commerce was all over it, all for it, Coal Association, everybody. Then suddenly, some seemed to want to have a fight more than a policy. And they wanted to have a fight for the next election more than a policy, more than they wanted to work together to solve a problem. So now suddenly they say stopping the EPA for two years isn't good enough. We can stop them permanently. Folks back home will love that. They say they'd rather stand by and do nothing if they can't stop the EPA forever. In effect, that is correct. And they think the American people will not see through that. My amendment has been around for over a year now. People know what it does. So to call this a cover vote is disingenuous at best. EPA regulations that come into effect this year say that if a company wants to retrofit an existing or build a new power plant or factory, they now have to find ways to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. Because of these new rules, companies won't build that new factory, they won't build the new power plant, they won't employ some of the millions of Americans who are out of work, and that is why I believe these regulations need to be suspended. That's in my amendment. Senator Inhofe has repeatedly argued that Congress needs to make these decisions, and I happen to agree with that. My bill will give Congress the time it needs to discuss the options, and my approach creates a reasonable timeout. So doing away with the EPA authority doesn't give clarity. It indefinitely kicks the can down the road. My amendment, which unfortunately will come whenever it comes, uh, it no doubt won't do particularly well, Madam President, because all, the, all of the folks on the other side, and some, unfortunately some of 
of uh, our colleagues on this side will vote for that because they think it sounds kind of neat. Uh, it probably won't do very well, but that doesn't mean it isn't right. So let's have real solutions like clean coal. Let's play a role in meeting our energy needs. Let's be sensible about it. Let's be bipartisan about it. West Virginia is ready to provide that coal, and so are a lot of other states. I urge my colleagues to support my amendment and quickly turn to a discussion about our nation's energy future. I thank the chair and yield the floor. And note the absence of a quorum.